Hey, everybody. My name is Ross Burnett. I'm excited to present today. Uh, excited to be the first presentation. Uh, and uh, this is my first state of the map, but it's great to see a bunch of familiar faces in the crowd. It's, uh, I've heard nothing but great things about this conference, so um, looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to be talking about how OpenStreetMap can support the monitoring of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So who am I? I'm Ross Burnett. I'm a project manager at Azavia. Azavia is a software company based in Philadelphia. Uh, we prioritize working with open source, um, working in the open, and uh, we're a B corporation with a mission to advance the state of the art in geospatial technology and apply it for civic, social, and environmental impact. So the sustainable development goals are completely aligned with the type of work we want to do. Um, it's been relatively new. We've been working on the sustainable development goals for about uh, a year now. I went to the first conference uh, to kind of explore that world last year in Dubai at the World UN World Data Forum. Um, and just like it's a whole, there, there's so much um, different efforts and, and work going into it. It's, it's a pretty exciting space. So uh, my talk today, um, intro, that's what's happening right now. I'm going to give a broad overview of the SDGs. So just to help provide context for the depth that I go in, um, could you please raise your hand if, you've, if you're familiar with the SDGs? Cool. Looks like about half of you. So um, I just have a few slides that are going to talk about it a little more in depth. Um, then I'm going to do a deeper dive into one SDG indicator in particular. That's going to be 9.1.1. Uh, Azavia has a project working on uh, evaluating indicator 9.1.1 uh, for the entire world. Uh, discuss a little bit of the technical approach of doing that, talk about opportunities, challenges, and next steps, and then leave a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, uh, Azavia has been working with OSM for um, the last couple years, and um, it's still, there's, it's such a rich, deep community, and I'm, I'm curious because I'm, I'm certain there's folks in the audience that are uh, doing related work, and I'm really interested in hearing about your challenges also, so I'm hoping uh, to start some conversations uh, either in the room or beyond the, beyond the talk. Um, so broadly speaking, um, the SDGs, there's 17. Uh, they are global. Uh, it's a global framework for um, measuring, for helping to measure and set targets for the Agenda 2030. These are where do we want to be uh, as a global community of humans um, in 2030. These are very ambitious goals. like. Um, ending poverty, ending hunger, ending climate change, these very overarching, like hard to argue with, these are good um, goals. Um, and, but to, to help measure the target to these goals, um, each goal is broken down in between about one and five targets, and then the targets are broken down in between one and five indicators. And these indicators are quantitative measures that can be tracked um, and compared over time. So we can see how, how is our progress towards, um, toward, towards the goals. Um, there's so much um, open data that can be used to support the SDGs and a lot of open geo data. Um, I gave a talk similar to this one um, in April at PhosphorG in San Diego um, with a little more focus on satellite imagery, but I find a lot of overlap between the type of things that are observable with satellite imagery um, and what uh, in terms of uh, measuring, monitoring, observing geospatial data and what's available with OpenStreetMap. So GEO, the Group on Earth Observation, put out a report um, a couple years ago where they evaluated all 17 of the indicate of the SDGs and then mapped out which ones have either a strong or like totally um, geospatial component. So some of the indicators like uh, increasing the reading level of um, the average uh, average youth is not exactly geospatial, although many of the indicators uh, are discuss a proportion of a population. These start to be questions that are geospatial and then some are extremely geospatial in nature in terms of um, what percentage of your country is covered uh, by forest. And so, um, and I'm going to discuss a few more that are um, very, uh, are more closely aligned with um, OpenStreetMap. So came across my attention um, that Tyler Radford gave a talk somewhat similar to this one a few weeks ago in Stockholm uh, at the Wikimania conference. And it was exciting to see how he's, how hot um, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team is thinking about some of these same same types of questions. Um, he went into a lot of um, more in the field um, 
data collection. He gave a few examples of working in Tanzania, uh, working with folks to collect points of um, safe drinking water and helping uh, measure all the sewage, uh, open sewage um, that was in Dar es Salaam. Um, and he links to a report uh, that I copy at the end in the resources on um, a number of tools that they found. I actually reached out to Tyler a couple days ago and asked if I could include this slide. Um, it's sort of a mashup in between, in between a couple slides. Um, and he's like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta figure out how to collaborate. This is, this is great. Um, so um, it's, for me, part of the reason the SDGs are exciting is because there's this, it's like, it's a framework, it's a way of talking about a lot of these same goals that we have, but um, people have spent a lot of time thinking about these metrics and how we can measure them. And so having this kind of common framework for talking about it, I find, I find really helpful. So going into a few of the specifics of, uh, I'm going to go through about five indicators um, that you can clearly see, or like if this information was in OpenStreetMap, uh, we'd be a pretty good way into reporting on this indicator. So the first one um, is 11.7.1. And so the way these work is, this is goal 11, target seven, indicator number one. So there'll be a few different, um, few different targets for each goal and then a few different indicators for each target. And so this is the average share of the built-up area of cities that is open that is open space. So we can we already know that there's a lot of parks and open governmental land and kind of open land. Um, and if we knew that it was just perfectly mapped, we could take that data from OpenStreetMap and then directly have this uh, have this indicator calculated. Um, another one is the proportion of the population using safely managed sanitation services. So in developed countries, we take for granted a lot that we have access to clean drinking water. This is clearly not the case for much of the world. Um, and there are, uh, you could imagine adding into OpenStreetMap, here's, um, here's a hand washing facility, here's, here's a um, faucet, here's, here's water. And so having a sense of um, coverage of these different features could be really helpful for helping to understand um, how we're doing in terms of clean water and sanitation. Um, similarly, we take for granted access to ATMs and banks. Not the case for much of the world. How are these services distributed? Where are there gaps? If that information was in OpenStreetMap, you could start to have a better sense of tracking, tracking these indicators. Uh, proportion of important sites for terrestrial and freshwater biodiversity. Again, um, coverage of protected lands. Um, that information we could imagine being, being in an open street map to help understand uh, how these areas are, are protected. And the one that I'm going to go much deeper in is SDG 9.1.1. This is the proportion of the rural population who live within two kilometers of an all season road. Um, I am excited about this one in, in many ways because it is relatively straightforward. Um, in, in principle, you can understand we're looking for roads and we're looking for the population within them. Then I'll go into it in a, in a little bit in terms of, well, what exactly is all season and what exactly is rural? Um, these are questions that you, you need to start really getting into the weeds in. But compared to some of these other indicators, it's, there's the data sets that you need are clear. So um, I want to take a second to walk through the kind of process of what is this, this system of SDG uh, of the targets and indicators? So we kind of have the shorthand version of the title, Industry, Innovation, and Infrastructure. So what, what does that mean? Um, that's just a shorthand to kind of fit onto this nice, pretty UN uh, format. So it's kind of compelling image uh, that you see all over the place once you enter this SDG world. Um, but the actual title of the goal is a little bit longer building resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster inno innovation. You're like, okay, that's a little more meaningful, but still don't know exactly what that means or how we could measure it. Then the target attempts to clarify it a little more specifically. We're developing infrastructure. The purpose of we're, we're doing this is economic development and human well-being, and we want it to be affordable and equitable. So we want, we want to make sure those rural populations are being serviced in addition to um, our urban populations. And then the actual indicator, this is, um, we can put a number to this. We could calculate this for a country and then at the end have a proportion, 70%, 80%, 100%. And uh, I've had this conversation because I think it's important to be critical of these. It's like, is building roads actually good? 
Um, we kind of take that we kind of take that for granted, but there's actually cases where that might not be good. Roads bring in roads can bring in crime. Roads can lead to deforestation. Uh, roads can bring all kinds of negative consequences with them. So it's this constant balance and, and being critical. Um, but the point of the goal is getting at access to services like health services, um, economic opportunities, uh, education. And so roads are being used as a proxy for access to these, these different um, services that, that we do more black and white assume are good. Um, so a lot of the indicators have this sort of, we have to, we have to evaluate and are there ways to take that into account. So how are the SDGs being monitored now? Um, no one organization has access to all the data that we're going to need um, to calculate the indicator value for any, any of the SDGs. Um, we couldn't even possibly hope that it would just all magically be an OSM, but it's this concept of piecing together the different data sets, um, knowing where they're at. So I'm going to talk about how, how they're being measured, because it's, it's, a, it's a massive system. Um, there's over 230 indicators. Um, and 169 targets. And some of them are much more uh, clearly defined. And so we have the system, the UN created the system of tiers. So each of the indicators is uh, assigned a tier. So a tier three means the methodology is not even established. Even in the example that I'm going to walk through a little bit more, 9.1.1, it's relatively straightforward, but you still get questions like I'd mentioned what's rural? Um, what is all season? Um, should two kilometers, should we just stick with two kilometers or is two kilometers the same in a mountainous region as a flat region? Are we, if you live across a river from a road, do you still have access? So you get into this nitty gritty of like uh, disagreement. <laughs> it's like, well, that indicator doesn't make sense in, in my area. It doesn't make sense in, in my city. Um, and so establishing that methodology, there's working groups, there's calls, there's a lot of information and, and meetings and discussion that go into this. So advancing from tier three to tier two is actually a fairly significant and complicated process. So once you hit tier two, that means the methodology is clear, um, but the data is not regularly being collected. Um, in the in 9.1.1, we, we have access to that data, um, but some, some of, uh, at least some, some versions of that data. Um, but for many of the indicators, how, how are we going to measure the reading level of, of the youth? Do we have a good way of capturing that information? Um, so you can't get to a tier one unless that data is regularly being produced for 50% of the countries and you have a clear established methodology. So this tiered system helps understand um, priorities for funding, how are some of, some of the SDGs are like, receive lots of funding, some receive a lot less. Is that is that being equitable to kind of the needs and, and the ability to, to measure and manage? Um, so in addition to the tiered system, you have this concept of a custodian agency. Each of the 230 or so indicators is assigned a UN custodian agency. So these are groups like the World Bank, UN Habitat, World Health Organization, and they work with the countries, um, they work with the statistic offices um, to refine that methodology and to report on it. And I was grateful to see that um, some of the uh, some of the custodian agencies are really open and excited, actually, about OpenStreetMap. So the World Bank, who's the custodian agency for 9.1.1, um, there's a uh, he he wrote this recently in a blog, but they are pr actively promoting the use of OpenStreetMap um, and introducing it to to countries to um, to start to include that in the official statistics. So then there's this concept of the National Statistic Office. Um, most countries have one. Some countries have, like, it's more distributed. The US actually does not have one NSO. We're divided between all sorts of different groups. Um, but a lot of countries have one National Statistic Office that is responsible for reporting on things like GDP and trade and generating official statistics for a country. Um, in some cases, the NSO is just burdened suddenly, like, do everything you're doing and do SDGs on top of that. Um, some cases you have countries where there's someone dedicated to measuring and monitoring reporting on SDGs. So you see quite a wide variety um, and we could imagine some countries are more equipped to gather and collect this data. Um, some don't have capacity. And so understanding that landscape um, is helpful to understand the state of, state of the SDGs. So how did Azavia get involved with this work? Um, Azavia created an open source tool called Raster Foundry, uh, which is a tool for using satellite imagery um, created in partnership with NASA and Department of Energy um, used to collect uh, 
and make available open data sets. And uh, a group at the UK Office of National St Statistics saw Raster Foundry, wanted to include it in something called the UN Global Platform. This is a tool that is to be distributed to um, national statistic offices to help them calculate um, the, the SDGs, am amongst other things. So we started working with them, and then we said, okay, what's one indicator that potentially we could calculate within Raster Foundry? Uh, or within the, the UN global platform. And sort of, this is happening uh, maybe about 12, uh, maybe about last year, 12 months ago or so. And so we're at a conference um, at the World Bank and a few folks at Azavia met a group at uh, uh, international development organization called Cardno. And they had a project running with um, DFID, that's the Department for International Development um, at the UK that was uh, tasked with helping countries in Asia and Africa actually build roads, but a part of their funding was dedicated towards monitoring the progress and access uh, of folks to the roads. And they had been calling um, it a rural access indicator that's essentially synonymous with um, indicator 9.1.1. And we said, hey, we're looking to <coughs> develop the capacity to do something um, at a global scale, potentially with open data. They're working, prim they work closely in country with um, departments of transportation, um, various NSOs to actually collect collect the data that you need. And we um, developed this kind of pilot project that's actually started about a month ago. Um, and so we have some preliminary results that I'll, I'll share in a little bit. Um, so we said, okay, how do we, how do we actually measure this thing globally? Um, again, 9.1.1, we just need three data sets in principle, access to roads, access to country's population information, and then these rural boundaries. And thankfully, there's open data uh, globally that's available for each of the three indicators. We have OpenStreetMap for roads. We have the NASA gridded population of the world data set that's a raster data set. I think it's 30 meter or 100 meter resolution of um, population. And then Grump, uh, the Global Rural Urban uh, Mapping Project, which um, defines urban and rural boundaries. And so each of these data sets is incomplete um, but we chose them as a means to start kind of this benchmark. Can we, can we get some initial values? Um, and so the, the reason I'm excited about it is, yeah, it's, it's not going to be the most accurate, um, especially given all the, all the considerations of, uh, open street maps, not equally mapped in, in all countries and, um, maybe Grump defines urban and rural that doesn't apply, their methodology doesn't apply across countries. So it's important to work within countries and talk to them, ideally get a country's data set um, and to, to be able to make that comparison. So part of my premise, and hopefully we'll have um, our final product uh, supposed to be in the next month or so, but the concept is if we go present at a conference and say, hey country, hey, hey Columbia, your um, SDG 9.1.1 value is 60%. And they're like, no, we, we think it's higher than that. And we're sort of hoping to encourage a conversation. We wanna make lots of caveats. Like, this is, we don't think this is the final number, but using the best available open data, using this methodology, here's what we arrived at. Um, if you have better data, ideally, let's get it into OpenStreetMap. Um, but otherwise, let's compare it and see, see how it's different. Um, and everything we're doing is uh, open source, transparent, um, and not trying to, uh, yeah, not trying to go, we're trying to work with the countries. Um, so some of the challenges we're facing are definitions, data quality, and methodology. Um, this is uh, in terms of, yeah, in, I've mentioned it several times now, but what's rural, what's urban? Um, is this data good enough? And then methodology, both in terms of how you're actually generating that number, but then is it possible to scale this up? So that was part of the opportunity that was interesting to Azavia. Can we do this at this global scale? And what are the implications of um, using all of OpenStreetMap uh, in doing a global calculation? Um, so something in addition, so we have this all season. So what makes something all season? The concept is we don't want, uh, we don't want a, a dirt road that gets flooded out uh, half of the year to count as actually access to these different services. So can we rely on tags? There's a tag in OpenStreetMap that's surface type. Um, and so one of the preliminary maps we have, we did a demo for South America as kind of a prototype. 
And in yellow, we have all the tags of roads that are like we could, we could consider paved. And I'll go through uh, what that might mean in a second. Um, green, teal is like pretty clearly unpaved. And then you can see the vast majority of roads are undefined. There's no, there's no tag for the surface type. Um, and so for South America, there was about 7 million road segments. And um, the vast majority uh, were null, just no, no, nothing put in there. Lord knows when I'm adding roads to OpenStreetMap, I'm mostly just adding roads, um, not worrying about all the different uh, all the different features for better or for worse. Um, and so the top handful we can recognize, we can say, okay, I kind of know what that means. Um, but I created this very fancy data visualization tool yesterday um, to show there's over 400 um, 400 tags, and you go down like past the first 10, um, and you start seeing characters that you don't recognize and salt and, and you and uh, all sorts of things that like inc inconsistencies. And so these, um, it was like two thirds of the tags had only one or two instance type uh, instances of that. And so if we're gonna rely on OpenStreetMap for this, um, clearly we gotta figure out a way to take this, take this into consideration. Um, so how did we do the actual analysis for this at a global scale? Um, the team that I work on, uh, creates an open source tool called GeoTrellis. This is an open source Scala library um, for primarily working with raster data, but increasingly we've been working um, with OpenStreetMap and vector tiles. Uh, it leverages Apache Spark to do distribution. Um, and then another more recent library at Xavier called VectorPipe uh, for working with OpenStreetMap data. And then visualizing the results with vector tiles. So what we do is we clip all the geometries to a regular grid. Um, and then find the center points, uh, reproject to UTM, so we have a standard meaningful uh, uh, two kilometer buffer. If you just had the web mercator, that two kilometers very quickly doesn't make any sense. Um, and then do a summary with the um, NASA population data. Um, so if you want, this demo for South America is available online, demos.azabia.com, but rather than try and do it live, I just took a little screenshot. Um, so more or less, we've collected the values for each country, um, and then just to help understand the different, uh, the different distribution of the streets, added those in as vector tiles, and then the blue dots are Mapbox uh, data visualization tool for showing um, hospitals. So I just pulled the, I forget if it was 10,000 or so, um, uh, anything labeled as hospital from OpenStreetMap, just to start to get a sense of how, how are these distributed and how, what's, what's the access like. Um, so this is sort of a preliminary version, um, but starts to get a sense of how, uh, how are these things distributed. So some of the lessons learned, and these are actually from some of the notes with our partners over at Cardno, um, but I think there's gonna be some talks later about different road agencies and how they're working with OpenStreetMap, but um, our partners are constantly sending emails, oh, we just met with the group in Ghana, we just met with the transportation, transportation agency in uh, Tanzania, there, there's several of them, they're not talking to each other, um, they haven't heard of OpenStreetMap, and so just there's like an education component of, is this, uh, it, and as far as they're concerned, our partners are big advocates of OpenStreetMap, and they're like, it's the only integrated platform that they're aware of where the different road agencies can work together. Um, and they're saying that if the government agencies are involved in the OSM update, then the national statistic offices are more likely to endorse, uh, endorse that data as official. There's a couple countries that it's like this sort of semi-official status, if that's even possible, um, but uh, for these SDGs, you need this like authenticated, this is an official recognized data set, and each country has different processes for what that looks like. Um, so what's next? Some open questions that I have. Um, is global public data good enough to measure the SDGs? I think, uh, for me, at least, it's pretty compelling for 9.1.1. Um, I'm certain the data quality for others is like not nearly as good. Um, in large part, we picked 9.1.1 because you could have a sense of, like it's, it's fairly complete, at least in some countries and some regions, so we can have a sense of, sense of it, but can OpenStreetMap be good enough um, for other SDGs? And then what is this process of authenticated and validate, validated data? Um, how do we have consistency in tagging types and uh, this country endorses this data and is, and is monitoring it? And then what role do private companies have in SDG monitoring? Um, there's different funding sources. Do you work directly with countries? Um, do you work with uh, philanthropists or groups like the World Bank? 
Um, and then some of the conversations that I'm, I'm hoping to have in the, in the next couple of days are uh, just is work that you're doing already aligned with an SDG. Um, there's like, they're pretty dang broad. Um, there's a document that I'll link to and I can share this out. I don't know if there's an official means or I can tweet it out, um, the presentation, but there's a link to all 230 um, indicators and it's pretty easy. I sometimes, if I have a new interest in mind, I'll like scan through that list and think like, okay, this could be relevant or this is not relevant. Um, but again, I think the SDGs are a useful framework for kind of funneling a conversation. I, uh, I want, I'm, I'm certainly not like, they're, they're just the best and they're gonna solve all their problems. It's like by 2030, everyone kind of recognizes we're, we're probably not gonna get there, um, but at least having a, a focus for the conversation. Um, contributing to OSM, always good. Um, and then sharing, yeah, uh, are there other data sets either, either already in OSM or could be imported into OSM that might help um, monitor the SDGs? Um, so here are some resources uh, for the uh, that geo publication I mentioned. Here's the group from Hot OSM or the the guide from Hot OSM that talks about OSM plus um, the various SDGs they're looking at, um, the full list of indicators, and then the demos. So I think I'm right on time. That's what I got. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I should have said, does anyone have questions? Yep. Um, thank you. That's really cool. Yep. Um, in terms of the OSM community, um, given how you sort of got a deep dive into a number of different countries, what do you see as sort of the biggest value add that can be achieved in the OSM community? Is it, is it you know, presence of data, of real data? Is it you know, hanging out the tags like you said? And then sort of as a follow up, do you feel that the tools available to the OSM community now can help you achieve what you would like to achieve? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Matt. That's a, that's a great question. Um, from my partners uh, working with Cardno, um, they said just a lot of these road agencies in a lot of countries don't, don't know about OSM um, and are maybe more suspicious of, of OSM. And I think there's a there's an education component of like, actually, this this is better data than than we see in a lot of cases. Um, so I think part of it is just like uh, continuing to talk about and sort of it, at what point, and I'm sure there'll be other talks about this, but at what point is this good enough um, to be an official data set? We could imagine there's gaps in even the official data set. So I think um, if you have any ability to talk with road agencies in, in Africa, that's, that's a great option. Um, and then I think I, I'd be interested to see other examples like this. I think doing it um, globally for a lot of the data sets is probably unrealistic. We chose this one because I think it's one of the lowest hanging fruits, but maybe you could do it at a city scale or maybe you could do it um, at a, a national scale of like, let's coordinate that one that was like mapping all the parks. Can we get a reasonable estimate on that number by like having a concerted effort to map the park? So I think I think that's probably one way. Um, I think the tools are available. It's a matter of uh, coordination, and, and is this is this important? Yeah. Um, have you guys thought about ways to try to assess the completeness of you know all these different data sets that you're working with to try to get some kind of confidence? Yeah. Um, actually, I I forgot to mention, but my colleague Eugene Chapish will be giving a presentation focused on vector pipe and comparing. Um, OpenStreetMap buildings to the Bing building footprint data set that was released. And we did a, a national comparison of just a building matching algorithm. Um, so roads are definitely more difficult uh, to do at that type of scale. Um, and we haven't we haven't really got there yet. Um, but we want to, in this case, compare um, the global data that's available with the in-country specific data. Um, so that's I think it's just getting started. And definitely, that's going to be essential. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that's just for urban areas, so I'm curious whether or not there's a similar sort of shift in consciousness within rural access, so yeah. not just whether or not there's a road next to your house, but yeah. whether or not you can access health services using that road and educational services using that road. Yeah. 
I I haven't heard about anything about that, um, so I, I can't speak to that, unfortunately. But yeah, I'd love to chat more. And on that note, thanks, everybody. I'd love to have conversations with folks about this in the next couple of days. All right.